Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. It is my great pleasure to kick off today's meet forum on digital transformation co-promoted by ESP and Deloitte and in cooperation with OECD. And this high level forum was uh, preceded a few days ago by the one on climate change, April 29th. And it will be followed by the second edition of the Global Policy Forum on the most pressing global issues, again co-hosted by ISPI, OECD, Bocconi University, and T20 Indonesia on June 20, 21st. We are extremely happy to be working with our friends in Indonesia. Uh, we, they accepted to continue our last year uh, new venture together with you and others, the, the launch of the Global Policy Forum, which is now becoming a feature of the T20 exercise. So today's forum is uh, steering transition through turbulence. Uh, I don't think I need a lot of words on turbulence. Uh, uh, I think we have been heavily into turbulence in the last uh, three months. Uh, but we stress the word turbulence for two strictly connected reasons. First, of course, the Ukraine war, which is escalating up cybersecurity threats and further weakening the already fragile global digital cooperation. Already fragile global digital cooperation. And second, uh, growing digital fragmentation. In the absence of a globally agreed framework for digital governance, China's long-standing Great Firewall and Russia's recent attempts to disconnect itself from the internet may lead to digital iron curtains. We have other iron curtains, but uh, uh, that may lead also to digital iron curtains. In light of these two factors, digital transformation looks like a self-driving car. It doesn't yet provide the necessary safety guarantees, also because of regulation lagging behind, and risk being a luxury for the very few. Uh, to tone down security risk and fragmentation, uh, it's clear that strengthened international cooperation is needed. All the more so because digital transformation is a key driver of tomorrow fair and sustainable growth. An estimated 70% of new value created in the global economy over the next decade will be based on digital transformation. Uh, that's why today's forum is more important than ever. Even if we are all at ISPI, and not only at ISPI, uh, very much focus on the dramatic events in Ukraine. I'm extremely happy, I'm glad to have with us senior experts and personality who will tackle this issue and answer a number of key questions. How to fight digital fragmentation and move towards a universal and affordable internet access? how to strike a balance between digital sovereignty and data protection. And last but not the least, what are the lessons learned on cybersecurity in the wake of the Ukraine war? So, again, I'm glad to leave the floor to the meeting, to the forum, and to give the floor to Fabio Pompei, CEO of Deloitte Central Mediterranean, for his opening remarks. Fabio. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you, ESP, of course, for hosting us in this quite important uh, meetings, quite important forum on digital transformation. Uh, I'm quite honored, you know, to start the meeting. Let me say there's no need to remark again the importance of digital transformation uh, during this period. It's clearly a topic that is on the agenda, on the table of all the governments, of all the institutions, of all the business communities, of course. Uh, what happened in the last 
couple of years uh, was extremely important for digital transformation because uh, the pandemic, uh, of course, pushed significantly uh, towards uh, a more, you know, uh, important uh, uh, sharing and diffusion of digital transformation, of digital use of new technologies. Uh, this happens in all the countries, but just to give some information about what happened in, in Italy, because in Italy, of course, we, we have probably one of the most relevant gap in terms of the use of new technologies, and particular digital technologies. Now, in, uh, according to ISTAT report in 2021, 14% of the Italian companies with more than 10 employees use a uh, web channel through a uh, digital platform, uh, which is very close to average EU, which is 15%. Uh, so this is reducing significantly the gap that we, have, we had until a couple of years ago. The percentage rise to 24% to, for the big companies, with the increase of 4% compared to the year before. So, uh, what happened is that, let me say, uh, Italy uh, has very often happened when uh, it needs to face an emergency, a situation, uh, uh, you know, unexpected, has the chance and has the ability to react very positively. And this is exactly what happened uh, during the pandemic, because nobody could have even imagined a couple of years ago that all the institutions, all the business, the medium-sized companies in Italy could react in this way and could evolve through a remote working uh, that is completely unthinkable uh, till a few months before. So now the point is that we need to, you know, let me say, uh, transit to from a reaction to an emergency to the second phase to so to a more strategic uh, thinking to uh, the need for having a, a plan a strategic plan and then of course implement the the strategy which is always or not always I would say often not our best attitude let me say but this is absolutely important in terms of of course infrastructure because we need to expand our uh, large band, we need to avoid that the digital divide, which is clearly an issue, uh, particularly in, in several countries, but in Italy for sure. Uh, we need to reduce in order to avoid that significant part of our society, of our people, uh, remain, you know, marginalized in our society. But at the same time, we need to also invest in our competence, uh, our uh, report in uh, Digital Economic and Society Index in 2021 uh, still uh, positions the Italy at you know the last three places in Europe for basic competence, uh, digital basic competence, the four last uh, position for advanced uh, competence, digital competence. So we need to to you know have a step up, a step up significantly. In this regard, uh, we launched an observatory a couple of years ago regarding uh, uh, the STEM disciplines, where Italy clearly is far behind a lot of European uh, go countries. Uh, now we are launching, the government is launching the strategy, the national strategy for digital competencies. We need to invest significantly in our competence in our competence in technology, in the new technologies, and particularly in the digital technologies. Uh, of course, these investments are crucial together with the investment in research, in innovation, and to do this, we need to have all the stakeholders working together with a strict relationship. So public institutions, governments, business communities, universities, center of research, all working together in order to, let me say, uh, accompanying our society to a very, very uh, deep transformation. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Uh, you, in a few words, you help us to understand how hot the topic is. 
Uh, this room in mid-May let us understand how hot the topic of climate change is. This is usually the, the, the hot uh, temperature we have in mid-July. Uh, uh, but we are, we are moving fast, uh, very fast. So with these two hot topics, I have the pleasure to give the floor to Cabrini, who will be conducting the next uh, session. I think we have to wait for... Welcome everyone to the opening session on the Forum on Digital Transformation. In this session, we're going to have some initial remor remarks in the form of keynotes from four distinguished speakers that you already saw in the, the image right behind me. Now, uh, we're going to have, during the afternoon, uh, people here, physical guests, but also people connected, and this is the case for this opening session. Now. Let me start with the first one, which is Roberto Viola, who's Director General of the DG Connect of the European Commission. Today, I have to tell you, it's a very special day to discuss digital transformation because in Paris this morning, it just opened the minister session of the Trade and Technology Council, which started working six months ago in Pittsburgh, and it's getting an increasing value in terms of the importance of the discussion between the EU and the United States. It's about tariffs and trades, about steel, for example, they've been working a lot, but more importantly, they are working on common principles to move to a, towards a 21st century economy and technology ecosystem, meaning common principle, for example, on data sharing and data protection to create the framework for the right data flow from Europe to the US and vice versa, transatlantic data flow. This is what they're discussing in Paris with Anthony Blinken, with Margret Vestager, for example, Vasily Dombrovsky, and the first line of the Department of Trade and the Technology Department of uh, the White House. So let me start with Roberto Viola that, accordingly to this, He's involved in this meeting, so he's not going to be present today, but he taped a couple of answers to the most more crucial questions uh, on, on the table. The first one is, as I was mentioning, the balance between data sharing and data protection. How is it possible to strike the balance is the first question we asked Roberto Viola. This is a very interesting and important question if you like, is the question. Because when uh, we have uh, uh, adopted our data strategy and implemented uh, through our legislation, this is clearly the question we have been asking our stakeholders, we ask asking the world, and the question we had to answer when presenting the solutions. In a way, although it's a key question, is it really a question? Can you have uh, a thriving data economy without protection of privacy? Can you have uh, the protection of privacy without an economy, a data economy that functions? I think the answer must be no to both questions because a modern economy, uh, a leading economy like the European economy needs both. And this is the case for all the advanced economies in the world. There's no possibility to be credible in front of our citizens and say, we want to use the data for better. We want to use the data to generate value, but we are unable to protect the data. You have seen what happened in uh, uh, the, all the discussion that has been uh, going on on the large platforms. I mean, large vertical integrated platforms They've uh, really been under social scrutiny. 
under scrutiny of the economic actors, because in some cases they could not get this balance right. So public powers have to get this balance right. It's, it's of course a dynamic balance, it's complicated, but we got to get it right, especially from the public policy perspective. And of course, this is the starting point. And then of course, in terms of corporate culture, uh, this also has to be the right balance. Now, let me, let me be a bit more specific. I mean, um, when looking, for instance, uh, to our two flagship legislation in the area of data, uh, you, you've seen that uh, uh, we have adopted the so-called Data Governance Act, and we are discussing the data. This is about, uh, in one, uh, actually two words, sharing the data and actually uh, making sure that uh, the data can be utilized. And of course, this uh, uh, two legislation complete the triangle with the, uh, the general data protection regulation, the GDPR. Now, what we want to make sure is that, first of all, uh, citizens are in control. Companies are in the control. Uh, that means, for instance, in the Data Governance Act, we have introduced uh, something that was already a little bit sketched in the data uh, uh, protection regulation, the possibility for citizens to choose to donate data for science, for medicine. I mean, we are all being uh, exposed to what is important in time of pandemic, I mean, to share the data. For companies, I mean, to agree to share the data, but at the same time to keep control, to avoid the negative externalities. Also, we have clarified that uh, while this balance is very important for personal data, there's no problem in sharing uh, uh, non-personal data, such as data generated by industrial robots, uh, Internet of Things, or other type of industrial settings. We have also championed the idea that uh, uh, Europe and other like-minded partners around the world should exchange data freely and data should flow uh, among uh, economies and societies. And that's the only way to advance. So I don't think to conclude there's an impediment, uh, which is the, the data protection, I mean, uh, above everything. The point is how to decline an effective data protection policy into an advanced data uh, governance and data sharing policy. And that's what we are trying to do. So uh, uh, to conclude my answer, yes, it is a very complicated question, but maybe it's not the question. The question at the end is how we can generate data while guaranteeing the citizens in terms of uh, their fundamental right. Well, and this is nef definitely the hottest topic in terms of the new EU regulations underway. As you know, we've got a Digital Service Act and Digital Market Act that just from a few months are underway. And there's a lot of discussion also from an industrial point of view. As you know, Meta, Google, Amazon, all the big uh, giants of the digital side, they are scrutinizing what Europe is doing to understand what they're going to do in the future. But there's another reason why this forum is really timely, and is the fact that we mentioned the digital translation in turbulent times. And uh, never times have been so turbulent from example, from, from what happening from Russia and Ukraine. Uh, many were expecting that digital warfare would step in brutally in this war. And in general, cyber war is at the center of the attention. Now, we asked Roberto Viola, what does he make in terms of the effort of the European Union to make cybersecurity better for individual member states? And how does it fit within the EU strategic compass? Thank you very much for this question. Indeed, in the times we live, it's a very relevant question. You know, it's, it's really, I mean, uh, difficult to come out uh, or hopefully to be about to come out from a pandemic and being in this uh, tragedy, which is the return to war in Europe and being confronted with Russia's aggression against Ukraine. But we have uh, learned certain lessons through the pandemic. And I think one lesson we have learned 
is that when Europe is threatened by a very large scale crisis, by a crisis that shakes the fundamentals of our society and economy, there's only one answer that works, which is the European answer. And the reason why we are seeing the light at the end of the tunnel of the COVID pandemic is because we have had a European response with a vaccination plan, with a COVID certification, and all the tools that we have deployed to fight the pandemic. It has been a race in terms of solidarity and working together where European institutions, member states, businesses, civil society have worked together. This teaming, this winning team, allows us to look a little bit more relaxed to the future of this pandemic. And when I look at the way Europe has organized the managing the pandemic crisis, I think the key has been that uh, at European level, we have been responsible for the coordination, for the vaccination plan, for making sure we had the digital certification working all over Europe. And then member states did implement the vaccination, did implement the, the uh, COVID certification and the other remedies with it that were necessary. But the central purchase of vaccines, of medicines, the central handling of digital certification has allowed an orderly way of fighting the pandemic. I think this is a very important lesson learned, which citizens understood, understood the value of working together, being European, but also the value that national institutions then would take over. And I think the same, exactly the same applies to cybersecurity. You know, cybersecurity is a large threat to Europe, and not only in this current uh, situation, but also in the future. Unfortunately, cyber threats are here to stay. They are risk number one, uh, or one of the risk uh, top risk for uh, companies. And that's why in the new directive for cybersecurity, we want that the board of companies, the C-level of companies, is responsible for cybersecurity policy and protection of companies. It is a threat for administration. That's why in the new law, European law, we want administrations to be fully aware and responsible for managing the cyber risk. It's a collective risk for our society and economy. So that's why we need the, the same reflex as the COVID pandemic. We need to be working together to have a common answer to handling cyber crisis at European level with European solutions. And then, of course, let the national institution, the cyber agencies, the intelligence agencies, the defense agencies, of course, the private sector, to actually do the work when it comes to handling this, but as part of a team. And that's exactly what we have learned out of COVID, that we are determined to do the same when it comes to cybersecurity. We are doing this as we speak uh, for dealing with, uh, with uh, what we are faced in Ukraine, but there's still a lot of work that we need to do and we need to do it together. And for sure, to conclude, this is fully in line with the strategic compass. To be stronger, in terms of our strategic ability in cybersecurity is one of the fundamental elements by which we can protect our citizens and our economy. Well, we thank so much Roberto Viola, Director General of the DG Connect, the European Commission. And even though he's working at the Trade and Technology Council today, he wanted to be here. And I think it was relevant to open with his point of view. But now we do have live speakers and we will broaden our perspective from the European Union to Asia, to the United Nations and to Africa. Let me introduce and I think you, we can show all the guest speakers here and uh, our Screen, big screen. So welcome to Yuko Harayama, former executive member of the Council for Science, Technology and Innovation of the Cabinet Office of Japan. Welcome also to Lindwe Matlali, founder and CEO of African 
Teen Geeks, and Maria Francesca Spatolisano, Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations for Co Coordination and Interagency. Let me start with you, Maria Francesca Spatolisano, because we know that at the center, one of the pillars of the UN agenda is the Global Digital Compact. What do you mean by this, and what does this consist of? Hello, and thank you, uh, everybody. Uh, I am very pleased to uh, be with you today in my capacity of uh, ASG of DESA, but also as the um, acting uh, tech envoy of the UN Secretary General. And let me start with the why part of your question. Why do we need this global digital compact? Now, clearly, um, managing rapid technological change is a defining challenge of our time, and the world has seen uh, how these technologies, the digital technologies and the internet, have fundamentally altered the way we live, we work, especially during the pandemic. So this high-level forum uh, addresses issues which are crucial and uh, the very topic of transformation through and by digital technologies go to the heart of the UN main uh, leading document uh, recently agreed, the UN Agenda 2030, which is about delivering on sustainable developing goals, which are associated with this agenda and that every member state has subscribed to. So what uh, I'm trying to say is that the leveraging digital technologies is critical to leaving no one behind in the digital age. And think if we succeed in leaving no one behind in the digital age, this will give an enormous acceleration to the delivery on these goals, which include education, uh, which uh, uh, will allow to provide uh, uh, more efficiently health services or financial services and other social services to our citizens and business, which will help countering uh, climate change and just a few examples here. But of course, at the same time, digital technologies, we all know, have uh, uh, sparkled the greatest controversies of our recent times and very many divisions. There is a geopolitical gridlock, obviously, and uh, the debates uh, about, uh, for instance, value-based approaches to technology, uh, the views are very divergent there. Uh, if you think of the scope and modalities of content moderation, if you think of tech regulation and the business model, we just heard from Roberto Viola how to uh, deal with the data. Uh, but there is also a, a lot of... Uh, you know, consequences in uh, uh, due to the, the use or misuse of digital technologies. There is consequences about uh, the, the trust in the information, misinformation, etc. So these digital technologies can be the new face of inequalities. And uh, I just have to remind you of the figure here. Over 2.9 billion people are still offline. We think everybody is connected. No, there are almost half of the world who is not. And these are mostly women and in developing countries. So even those who are connected, uh, sometimes, uh, uh, relatively often, uh, uh, they are within the range of connectivity, but they are unable to access and use the internet because of economic reasons or because they lack the basic skills to do so. So, and then when you are connected, of course, there are threats, child uh, sexual abuse or uh, harassment online, including of journalists and civic defenders, violations of human rights. So all this means that uh, we need to do something about it. We can't leave it to self-regulation. It's not a sustainable proposition as it's been, you know, so far uh, a very open space. We want to preserve the openness, but we need to give some common principles or rules of behavior. So the United Nations, uh, and this is, uh, now I come to the what of your question, the United Nations has risen to the challenge, we believe, providing leadership on these issues on a global scale, 
the Secretary General from his 2020 roadmap for digital cooperation to his more recently common agenda report, September of 2021, he has made the digital a priority of his action and he has called for a more open, free and secure digital future for all. And in particular, he has called for this global digital compact to be agreed at next year's summit of the future in September 2023. The compact itself is, we see it as a once in a lifetime opportunity to bring all of us, governments, the private sector and civil society together to agree on common principles that should underpin our digital future. And it is basically a means for us to discuss and to address these digital issues. There are seven of them which are listed in the common agenda, but there is room for others if they are relevant and there is consensus to, to address them. And so the opportunity to forge this new shared vision for global digital cooperation, which is anchored in UN values. And I highlight this because this is exactly what member states, uh, heads of states, governments have called during uh, the commemoration of the UN 75th anniversary in 2019. So the office of the Tech Envoy has just opened, and this is an information I want to share with you, a, a public space, an inclusive public space on our website, where else to gather inputs and views from everyone, everywhere, to prepare for this digital compact. And I invite you all and your organizations to engage with the United Nations and to contribute to the compact. And this forum itself has very substantive discussions and I hope the organizers will consider how to summarize it and to contribute to the compact process as well. So to conclude, um, I have to say it's not lost of course upon me that we face these digital challenges at one of the most globally divided times in recent history. But this makes our commitment and our determination to come together at the global level even more necessary. Oh, well, uh, thank you so much for this, Maria Francesca Spatolizano. And just before we leave you, just another quick question, because you reminded us that today 2.9 billion people are offline globally and we know that one of the ambition of the united nation by 2030 is to uh, allow a universal access to households and school to the internet and also to provide basic digital skills to all that are 15 plus globally but the question is how to achieve it how to fill the gap yeah, I'm very glad you referred to this set of uh, aspirational targets for universal meaningful connectivity. And the Office of uh, the Secretary General and Bion Technology and the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, have launched just last month. It was a culmination, I have to say, of a, a number of several rounds of multi-stakeholder discussions to implement the Secretary General's roadmap for digital cooperation and the achievement of this goal by 2030, the universal connectivity by 2030. Now, these targets are really important in a very concrete way because they provide the means to measure progress and form the basis of general cost and investment estimates. All of this is fundamental to design, realistic and action-oriented policy making and effectively programming policy interventions by all stakeholders. ITU is now looking for, towards a further building on these targets and will issue a report on the state of global connectivity, as well as working at the development of an online dashboard for countries, which means that each country will be able to see where its strengths are and to identify the gaps it needs to address in order to provide full connectivity to its citizens and business, a little bit like the report we heard about at the beginning of this session 
from the CEO of Deloitte. And uh, my office, the office of the Tech Envoy, is also working with other uh, key partners to promote universal connectivity in a number of ways and adapt it to local conditions, because of course the situations are differ in different countries. So uh, for instance, ITU uh, has a, a launched a groundbreaking really partner to connect digital coalition which is a multi-stakeholder alliance aiming at fostering meaningful connectivity and digital transformation globally with a focus, um, not limited to it, but with a focus to the hardest to connect communities, whether they are in least developed countries or landlocked countries or small island developing states. Talking of schools, as you rightly said, there is a very important initiative uh, by UNICEF and ITU called GIGA, which aims to connect all schools around the world to the internet. It has already mapped 280,000 schools globally and already more than 1,500 schools with 630,000 students and teachers have been connected. This is part of a pilot project in three uh, countries, Kenya, Sierra Leone, and Rwanda. And GIGA also is aiming at developing a financing instrument for school connectivity and country-level capital markets uh, products. So to conclude, there is, in fact, an overall global need to scale up efforts to achieve universal, meaningful connectivity through innovative uh, multi-stakeholder partnership and, of course, also renewed political will behind. And going back to your first question, I think it's important that we all advocate for the Global Digital Compact to contain a resounding call for the world to achieve universal meaningful connectivity by 2030, accompanied by concrete actions and commitments. And I count on all of your support. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria Francesca Spatolizano, for this uh, very relevant update on the UN perspective on digital transformation, digital compact, but also this aspirational target by 2030, which would make a great difference. <laughs> and with this, let me move to Yuko Harayama, and that was a former executive member of the body of the Japanese cabinet dedicated to technology and innovation, but is also a member of the OECD Observatory on Artificial Intelligence uh, Policy. Now, artificial intelligence is reshaping our world, not just the economy, our lives, and in perspective, is the strongest force and fastest force that is reshaping technology forever. So, what, what's your take on uh, you know how uh, artificial intelligence will also change the way we work, our workplaces, and you know we are in the way of the transition between the pre-pandemic and post-pandemic world. What's your take on this? Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for having me tonight, today, for you. Um, I was participating to the mostly on the global partnership on AI. As you know, it is an initiative uh, initiated by Canada and France, uh, launched in June 2020. Actually, we have 25 members. Uh, we have OECD as acting as a secretariat and uh, respecting OECD AI principles. And uh, it's aimed to bridge the gap between theory and practice on my AI. And we have a working group called Future of Work, and I was co-chairing this working group. So as such, um, we try to not making the projection or prediction of the future, but exploring the potential and transformative power of AI while carefully, uh, carefully examining potential negative impact of AI on the workplace, uh, such as biases, inequality, or privacy concern to ensure that we will have fairer and better work condition in the future. Um, today, uh, the expectation of job creation and the fear of job destruction are present simultaneously. For sure, the increasing use of AI will affect the organization quality and the nature of work, but still 
we are just at the beginning of a more profound transformation, not only in terms of businesses or work practice, but also society as a whole and the human to be human. And what we observe today is that AI is affecting different group of workers through the different path, the way we organize our work and even the scope of work. In fact, uh, the capacity to humans is tested, competed and challenged by AI at the workplace, rising the question of a competitive, competitive advantage human vis-a-vis -vis AI not only in terms of manual tasks, but also cognitive tasks. So we, and if we look at the work practice, we see the emergence of new ways of organizing work, such as the distributed work, remote work, or task-based work, and the trend of decoupling where we work is done and the physical workplace is ever expanding and all supported by and assisted by digital technology and the AI. And these trends have been consolidated under COVID-19 and it's become practice now. Um, we also can mention that the value of work is changing. Now the motivation of people to work is diversified today. Uh, this far beyond the classical work leisure dichotomy thinking. So not only considered as a source of income, uh, people see their work as a way to personal developments or fulfillments, a way to fulfill useful to your surrounding and to serve society more broadly. Thus the con concept of work should be revisited while assessing the impact of AI on workplace. So having said that, uh, there is a gap between what is expected predicted or promised and the reality. So still limited, but AI is already introduced and adapted in the workplace. And we need to observe carefully what's happening, kind of reality check in order to adjust the use of AI to prevent the misuse and to improve the quality of the workplace. So the solution is not to exclude AI from the workplace, but to use it intelligently. Again, the capacity of a human to be human is tested by, by AI. So that is for me, from me, for the past question. Well, thank you for this. But uh, as we hear, for example, in Italy, we still struggle to get a move to an industry 4.0 business model, which is digitizing traditional manufacturing. You are already looking at a society which is 5.0. I know you are one of the initiator of this idea, which is a society which is based on technology, but human centric. Can you tell us more on this and how in your idea in this society is going to work? Thank you for mentioning Society 5.0. I just short history of Society 5.0. We came up with this idea of Society 5.0 when we have been preparing our five-year science technology basic plan in 2015. Uh, as you mentioned, we had Industry 4.0 initiated by Germany and expanding uh, use of digital technology in the workplace, not industry sectors. But we have thinking about the, the context where we are in 2015, it was a time of accelerated change in terms of technology, uh, digital transformation in place, connected as network society, increasing sphere of human influences, and the increase also uncertainty. So we see the limits of a traditional way of formulating scientific knowledge policy, such as planning or providing a lot of mapping of new technologies. So as well as we have, we see the need to enhance the preparedness for the unforeseeable future. So we try to capture what should be the guiding principle in kind of precept. So finally, we came up with the idea of shifting from technology driven approaches to more human centered approaches. And also society backed by and also empowered by scientific innovation 
including AI, big data, and robotics, but respecting value of openness, sustainability, and inclusiveness, and as in line with SDGs from the United Nations, we wish to take everybody on board in this perspective. So what we can say today, after five years of operations, based on our experience with COVID-19, um, which imposed new rules of, new rules of the games, such as constraint on the mobility, person-to-person uh, -person relationship, and we had to change, uh, we visit most of the social institu institutions, which, in, which, uh, which uh, result with the increased inequality and the social divide. Um, COVID-19 was really pushing, accelerating uh, digital transformation, including open science, and also the way of tracking peoples. And uh, the reaction from the public and private sectors was already um, moving from, uh, we see the virtual substituting physical, and also as well as we really discover the sense of community and solidarity it has been mentioned by the keynote speakers. And we have to really assess what is really essential. So here in this context, key elements have been, again, law of scientific innovation, uh, keywords preparedness, and also take responsible action for the future generations. So the question is society 5.0 is still valid. I think, uh, the way we are we're shaping our society is always really always uh, using technology, not used by the technology, but keeping human center approach. It's becoming more than ever before, and uh, tackling uh, the the issue of COVID nineteen, we have to make really uh, mobilize fully uh, science, technology, innovation capacity to develop vaccine therapeutic diagnostic tools and also to understand the impact of COVID-19 on our society and human being. And also oh, we see the sense of a community at the heart of all action to take uh, care of society. And the key issues of everybody on board is really uh, becoming must because since increased inequality and social world divided observed. So, to conclude, as we, I, as I will say that we need to take socially responsible action for the future generation and for preserve our democracy and sharing the value of inclusiveness, sustainability, openness is critical more than ever. And we have to act different in the way to dis rediscover the sense of community and solidarity and preserve human touch so we need to have to take action with our multi-stakeholder approaches and by reconciling private and social benefits. I think that this is covering uh, within the, the concept of society from Brazil and we can take as such and then to lead in the future uh, oriented actions. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, all right. Thank you so much, Yuko Arayama, and uh, for also designing Society 5.0. And I think it has a lot in common with uh, what the, from the UN we heard about the future and uh, the digital compact and the ambitions of the United Nations. And uh, with this, let me move to Linda Matlalali, uh, who founded Africa Teen Cheeks, which is a social enterprise that teaches children and unemployed youth how to code. So my first question, uh, Lindley Matlalali, is uh, how do you think that young generation can be put at the center of the digital transition, especially in developing countries like in Africa, in your experience? I'm afraid you're on mute. I just realized, sorry. <laughs> good afternoon, everyone, and good morning, uh, depending on where you are in the world. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I think it's, it's um, for, for the developing countries, we can't just talk about um, 
digital transformation or or even you know exposure without talking about access and we can't also talk about access without talking about um, infrastructure and you can't also even dis start discussing infrastructure without dealing with the um, the elephant in the room, which mostly um, for us specifically in Africa, if I have to be specific, is um, corruption and, and looting that we see where a lot of state resources don't reach the people that um, it should reach. And, and that meaning that a lot of young people as Africa, we, we are the youngest generation. And also, we also are the ones that are most affected by poverty and, un and unemployment. And we can't deal with that without dealing with the the issue of the, the quality of education that the, the young people get. So um, that also brings in, in the importance of role or uh, the roles of social enterprise and social ent uh, entrepreneurs like myself is that we end up becoming the bridge between um, government and assisting in, in providing solutions to the people who need it the most. And those would be the most um, vulnerable, the poor, um, most of them who also don't have a voice and who are not able to go and, and speak up. And also because of the lack of education, they're also not equipped to even make the right decisions in terms of choosing the leaders. Because unfortunately, um, it becomes the... Um, the consequences of the leadership we have, it also impacts the generations and, and future generation. And that's why for us specifically is that, you know, as we've been um, recently, we just started partnering with um, the Christensen Institute um, in the US that, um, you know, uh, Professor Christensen was one of the, the guys who actually discovered, well, the guy, we call it the father of disruption innovation. And his last book that he wrote is um, um, The Prosperity Paradox. And for me, that was one of the most important book I think I have read because because it, it, it really focuses on how do we, um, how do you focus on teaching market creating innovation? And for me, that for reason that we wanna do train young people, not just on innovation, but specifically on market creating innovation so that they can start working on solving the problems themselves so that they can build businesses that also understands, you know, that also deals with the, the societal issue, issues that we have. For example, if you read that book, it talks about more um more ibrahim which i think all of us know who actually started um the cell phone industry in africa and we need um for not just africa but the developing world you need entrepreneurs like that who understand that it's not just about the idea that you have it's also important that as you build your solution you fix also the other challenges that you have from infrastructure that you have to build from you know training of this the, the staff that you need to employ so, and, and, and that is really important that we raise young people who will become entrepreneurs, but also focusing on fixing um, the education in the country, well, in, in, in wherever country that, um, that you are, specifically in the, developing, in the developing world, where the quality of education is also um, a challenge. And I'm also excited that I'm part of the, of the World Economic Forum um, Edison Alliance, which is focusing on, on digital inclusion in education, health, and, um, and, and finance. So it brings together social entrepreneurs like, like ourselves, uh, businesses, government, and civic society, but people who already are doing stuff. So it's action oriented. And I think that's the most important thing is that it's not just about talking about the solution. Because I think for us as Africans, we, we speak about it. There's so many research, there's so many documents that we can read that tell us what the problems are. But what is now required is actually getting people who are passionate about getting things done. And also, unfortunately, which is sad for me to say, but not relying on government, because I think for us, the biggest problem in the developing world is actually the leadership that we have. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Lindway Matlali. But just a very quick question, because you mentioned societal issues, and we know that technology can be a force that fills the gap of inequality, but can also create more inequality and asymmetries inside society. In which condition do you think that technology can play a role to make Africa more equal in your experience? 
I mean, I, 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 that is not a question about the, you know, the, the importance of, of access to, to, to technology. And the fact that you and I are meeting, you are, you are in Italy, I'm in South Africa, that just shows that, you know, how technology has opened up the world um, for all of us. So, but the, it became, the issue becomes really that in developing countries, we still have to deal with the issues of bread and butter. And while COVID has shown the importance of, um, of technology and access to, to technology, many times, I think for many African countries that I've seen, even including ourselves in South Africa, the quickest thing that our you know, leadership wanted to go back to is how do we go back to, to normal? But we know that normal is no longer, um, you know, uh, is, is no longer the right. We can't be saying we're going to go back to the way things were. Because if you go back to the way things were, we're going to still continue to have um, um, uh, the exclusion that we have. I mean, as South Africa, we are the most unequal uh, country, um, I think, in the world, according to the, the Gini coefficients um, 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 as uh, done by the UN, I think. So what that means is that we still we have to think as we solve the problems and talking about digital transformation and and inclusion we can't we can't not really deal with with those issues of bread and butter but technology for me is all access to technology is a really part of issues of bread and butter you know the world seeing what is happening with um ukraine the war in ukraine and russia and um, we've seen we you know uh, seeing the the world co coming together to support the ukraine we have the same for Africa. There's always a country, a country that is dealing with that, from um, from Cameroon to um, you know the DRC and recently Ethiopia. There's all these children who are affected by this, and for us, it's something that happens all the time. So it's very important that we, as we deal, we solve the problems, and I hope that the you know. Uh, with the world opening, you know, coming together to support Ukraine, they will also come together to also support all the other countries in the developing world whose their lives, their entire lives have really been, you know, affected by war or, or, or some conflict of, 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 of some sort. So it's, it's really important that digital transformation and, and access to digital or rather technology becomes a core uh, policy of every country, especially the developing world, because there's no way we can be competitive if we don't invest in that. Thank All you. right. Thank you so much, Linwe Matlali, CEO and founder of Africa. Team Jigs, uh, together with Yuko Haramaya and Maria Francesca Spatolizano, but also Roberto Viola for being, you know, the key speaker of our opening session. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This is the applause from Milan to all of you. And with this, we're ready to go into the first of the two sessions. We're going to discuss the key implication of this scenario. on digital transformation, what the key implications are when it comes to leading to a fair and sustainable growth. Together with me on the stage, Andrea Poggi, North and South Europe Innovation Leader of Deloitte. Thanks, welcome. And also welcome Pencho Kutzes, who is Senior Policy Advisor at CAS, Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. Welcome. And we already got connected in Katrina Deja, Director of Research of the World Wide Web Foundation, and David Jensen, Coordinator of Digital Transformation uh, Subprogram at UNEP. So let me start with Katrina Adeya, because uh, we know that men globally are more likely, apparently, to be online than women. And how do you think it's possible to bridge this global gap and how to work around this? Thank you very much. Um, in fact, I was enjoying listening to the session before because I think it was a great precursor 
to the kind of questions that we are having. And even some of the answers were actually there. So I'm even wondering, uh, what am I supposed to be doing? But let me just uh, cement uh, some of the presentations, um, especially the fact that, I mean, this is something that has been said for so long, that men are more likely to be online than women. How do we bridge the gender gap? I think for somebody like me who's been involved in research in this area for a long time, it's getting frustrating because the gap is even growing wider. Oh, and yet we've been talking about reducing it. If you look at it, the, we know the internet, of course, is a tremendous force for equality and opportunity. We know there's a huge digital gender gap that's presenting, uh, uh, preventing hundreds of women from accessing uh, the full benefits of the digital technology. Yet there are statistics that still show that men are 21% more likely to be online than women. And that's globally. But in, in the least developed countries, like where I am, it's 52%. Right now, uh, the digital gender gap uh, globally has reached over 55%. So we're talking about this, we continue to talk about this gap. It's just one of the ways that um, the internet is actually, for example, the internet is not working well for men and women. So it's from gaps in digital skills that I think was discussed in the first uh, session to online violence, to the abuse that's actually impacting the safety and rights of women. So if we don't understand the ways uh, women and girls are prevented from using the internet fully, we will not achieve digital equality. So that is some of the areas of research uh, we are focusing a lot on. And also we must be able to know that the digital gender gap is not a women's problem. It's not a women and girls problem, it's everyone's problem. So, and countries are actually paying a huge economic price when women are left behind in the digital revolution. We recently did a study in the Web Foundation, for those who may have seen it, on the cost of exclusion uh, of, of women and girls. And we've got evidence, empirical data. Just, I'll just give you a, a, a mind blowing figure that uh, it's estimated that $1 million, uh, trillion dollars has been lost in GDP over 10 years in the 32 low and lower middle income countries we studied simply because of uh, excluding women. So I think um, open, I mean, I could speak about this forever. Uh, I know somebody mentioned about governments, but the only way to succeed is also governments must publicly commit that they're actually working to close the gender digital divide, not lip service. I've gone for enough meetings where there's lip service. There has to be evidence of approaches to overcome the many barriers that of women's access and participation online. Uh, and whether it's literacy, whether it's skills, whether it's social pressures, there's a lot more that can be done. So maybe can I just open with that and uh, yeah, allow absolutely. others and uh, I'm sure I can come back. Yeah, yeah, that was really interesting. And let me move on a different aspect of the digital transformation with Penchokutsev because, you know, I think Penchokutsev that the concentration of power in what they call the gatekeeper, the digital champions, has never been so incredibly high in, in history, in economic history. And we know well the Western digital champions, but also in China, for example, there are a few, and the government has started what they call a breakthrough and recently last year. What do Europe is doing, you know, trying to create a playing level field with Digital Market Act, Digital Services Act. Is that enough? Is, is this going in the right direction? How do you see this? Many thanks. Um, great question. Many thanks to the organizers. Thanks, Alberto. Thanks, uh, Beatrice. It's really thanks to the co-organizer, OECD. It's really a privilege uh, being with you uh, in person uh, uh, today. Um, the Digital Markets Act is something that we should um, celebrate it in Europe. Finally, it, uh, it took too long and we got it um, finally thanks, thanks to the French presidency. We have uh, produced too many studies and we, we could have done it much, much um, earlier. Um, we have great experience when it comes to some landmark cases in Europe. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, the Google Shopping case or the Amazon case. We have learned a couple of days ago uh, um, something about the uh, Apple Pay uh, case. We know something about the Facebook case in Germany. Um, but all this takes too long. On average, uh, one abuse of dominant case against the gatekeeper takes about seven eight years. So the result comes too late and uh, the gatekeepers are really happy 
uh, to take the fine into account that they are going to pay it uh, seven or eight years later when they have already foreclosed the whole competition around. So fixing the problem, and that's it, restoring the balance to digital competition is much harder um, than taking preemptive uh, uh, measures. Um, so what's the DMA actually? The DMA, it's not a competition. The DMA, it's not regulation. It's something um, between. Uh, the DMA is the result from the past experiences that we have in the last 20 years in, in Europe with the big players. Um, it addresses gatekeepers. According to some calculation, it addresses 15 uh, undertakings. Um, we're going to see the first result in the beginning of uh, next year, beginning of the summer. The European Commission is probably going to designate five players, Meta, Amazon, Google, Facebook. Um, and uh, six months later, we are going to see the first obligation from the toolbox. We have 21 do's and don'ts in the Digital Markets Act, and um, we're going to see how it will, how it will go. Um, those kind of pro uh, prohibitions, I just want to mention a couple of them, is like the prohibition of self-preferencing, the prohibition to combine uh, data from different sources. Uh, that's the case of Facebook in Germany. That's the obligation to be interoperable. Um, but the interpretation will be crucial. It will take years till we find a common language when it comes to the implementation of the um, GDPR. So to come back to your question, is the DMA the right answer? Definitely yes, but if we are only serious about it. I'm saying this thinking of the GDPR because we have also landmark le uh, legislation in the world, but we were not serious when it comes to the enforcement. There are senior scholars like Johnny Ryan who are saying if you implement the GDPR properly, you don't need anything uh, like, like DMA or DSA. And maybe he is partially uh, right. So we have now a complementary instrument that should produce a better result than the GDPR has produced in the, in, the, in the past. We may expect great resistance. Finally, we are dealing with uh, uh, the biggest player in our uh, economy with huge legal departments. And on the other side, we have the European Commission with um, what I've learned, uh, approximately 80 new uh, staff personnel in, in, in Brussels and Luxembourg that should uh, implement some and enforce the uh, new legislation. Uh, in, in my opinion, this is, that's too little. So the European Commission definitely need much more resources in order to implement uh, uh, new regulation. Uh, what else needed is the Commission will have to develop um, the knowledge and the technical capability to understand data and algorithms. So they don't need any more lawyers in their department more and engineers. really need uh, more engineers really uh, to, to understand how data is uh, 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 traveling from one undertaking uh, to another in undertaking within the holdings. And um, yeah. so the implementing the new regu regu uh, regulation will be crucial and it will be a challenge in front of the uh, courts. To sum up, the DMA is the right answer. Um, it is the right answer if uh, we see the results in the coming four years. What does it mean? We want to see more contestable markets in Europe. Um, and um, we shouldn't save money on, uh, on resources. In, I'm uh, simply uh, saying to the small and medium enterprises in Europe, try to rely on the Digital Markets Act and try to challenge the gatekeepers. And if we don't see the result in a couple of years, then we are doing something wrong. Uh, yeah, definitely. And uh, we, we started uh, reminding that, you know, US and EU regulators are, and government officials are discussing today in Paris, many of these aspects, but missing at the table are the representative of these companies. That when it comes to new regulation, that also threatening you know, to opt out from the European market if the regulation will not go in that direction. In a word, do you think this is likely to happen or no? So I'm, I'm thinking of one aspect where there is, we're trying to produce converg convergent policy at, at the moment. And we should see what's going on in the US in the, till, till, uh, till November. And maybe we should use the momentum yeah. till that time because nobody knows what will happen 
after that, at least in the field of the competition, at, at least in the field of uh, antitrust regulation with Lina Khan in the FTC and Jonathan Cantor uh, as associate attorney in, in the US, we have similar way of thinking and we should use it, finally. This is huge, I mean, in terms of what might happen. And uh, in this session, we're discussing, you know, the digital transition leading to a fair and sustainable growth. I would add also secure growth. And with this, I move to um, uh, Jose uh, Siabaserate, who's Senior Associate Research Fellow at CARI and ISPI. And because one of the main aspects of what's going on is that Many digital assets are out there and including some digital currencies that are more and more popular. At the same time, just at the end of last week, what we saw was a crash in the valuation of a family of digital currencies that are considered pegged to the dollar. And this was another sign of how unstable or fragile is the framework today. What are the main key risks that you associate to this digital currency, but also the opportunities that are connected. I'm afraid you're on mute. Now I'm not. Yeah. Thank you. I will. Good. Welcome. Thank you, the organizers. <clears throat> I, I I understand that digital currencies are not now in the news. Uh, they should have been for quite a long time. Uh, this is uh, an experimental field that has grown a lot. Uh, I, I, I understand that there are many, many risks attached to the expansion of digital currencies uh, that uh, impact on, may impact on financial stability risks. Uh, you have risks with uh, safety and integrity of payment systems. Uh, you have uh, risks to market integrity and competition. You have a lot of risks attached to cybersecurity and operational resilience. Uh, data is crucial. You know that payment systems uh, involve data and data is a very valuable asset and you should care for privacy, protection, portability of data. You have impact in terms of tax compliance and compliance with norms against illicit finance you even have an impact on ESG terms, as you know, energy consumed to produce some of these crypto assets is, 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 is very intense. So you have a lot of uh, microeconomic, I would say, risks. And I, I, I think the system was needed, and now it's very obvious, uh, to, to have a strong monetary instrument embedded in, 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 in the digital ecosystem. Uh, Stablecoms were, were supposed to play that role, uh, but they are not doing that, and even less so the algorithmic stablecoins as, as Terra has proven. Uh, I, 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 I think that to control risks and to earn the benefits of digital currencies, uh, it, the, <clears throat> the, the strongest uh, measures, and they are achievable at the very short term, is to implant in the system a strong monetary instrument that it won't be a CBDC, a central bank currency, the digital currency, because it will take a lot of time for major central banks to uh, finish uh, their projects or, or to make a decision on that. But I, I think that uh, you can have a, a safe uh, stablecoin, national stablecoin, if you uh, apply some achievable guidelines to, for example, a privately issued stablecoin pegged to the national currency, backed by a liquid pool of safe assets and under the orbit of, the, of a central bank. In the same way, you can tokenize commercial bank deposits run them on the blockchain, and they could provide also uh, a monetary service uh, in the digital context uh, from legacy banks and under the control, under the surveillance of, of central banks. So I, I think there are huge risks. There are benefits which are quite clear. We've seen that uh, all central banks are improving their 
payment systems because of of the uh, <clears throat> of the search of, of a block of a bitcoin and blockchain and and the type of um, monetary competition that they could uh, imply and i i think uh, what the world needs is a, a safe instrument for the digital uh, age because uh, the problem is that not only the economy is going digital but society is going digital you spend more time more of your time digital people demand uh, seamless payments they like uh, them to be available 24 by by 7 uh, and the world is going in that direction there are many ideas like metaverse or web 3.0 that suggest that we will uh, uh, integrate more closely the physical and the digital world in the future, and we will uh, use uh, digital environments uh, for entertainment, social relations, office work, etc. So uh, you have to uh, be preemptive in that sense and think about developing uh, currencies and payment systems that are safe that could uh, provide the basis for a very resilient financial system that, that can operate in the digital uh, environment as well as in the physical one. Yeah. Uh, money yeah. currency competition could increase, cash could be used less and less depending on society tastes, and you are, as a central bank cannot be sure that your currency would be fit for the future. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense to get involved, learn about what uh, type of innovation are occurring. Much of the innovation comes from outside the financial system. And I think the, the old two-tier system where the central bank has a monopoly of issuing currency and commercial banks uh, are the ones that create uh, credit. That is also challenged by uh, fintech mm -hmm. innovations, by the big tech trying to enter finance and by blockchain and many innovation. And, 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 and I guess that what Terra has shown us is not only that the system is fragile, but that the people, even knowing those fragilities, yeah. are willing to involve in those risks. Yeah. As uh, Libra was a first wake up call for, for central bankers when Facebook pushed for a global stablecoin, uh, the huge uh, rise of uh, decentralized finance, or DeFi, was a second wake-up call. There's a huge decentralized uh, financial system working uh, aside, uh, far from the mm -hmm. traditional finance. And that is another thing that requires, as I said earlier, a very strong monetary instrument at the, at the core. Yeah. And I think... Uh, a commercial bank stablecoin under the guidelines of the central bank could provide the same service like uh, that Terra was supposed to, to, to provide and that it could be done better in a safer way with access to a lender of last resort, which was the key issue that uh, Terra well. and Luna Foundation didn't have access to. Thank you for this, uh, Jose Siabaserade. It's an urgent discussion, especially considering that these digital currencies and assets are really sexy for investors that basically are exposed to risks that they cannot exactly calculate. Last week in Milan, the Digital Transformation uh, Secretary here, here in Italy, Vittorio Colau, said kind of 10% of Italian investors are exposed to digital currency and asset risks, and 3% just entered the market during the pandemic months, but at the same time, protection laws are lagging versus the technology evolution. So there's a gap to be filled, and it's absolutely urgent. So with this, let me move to David Jensen, because a couple of weeks ago in this same space at HISPI, the first forum was on environmental transition, energy transition, climate change. So climate change and environmental transition are really connected with the digital transition we're discussing today. Where do you see the links and how about how to take the best out of digital to help to fight climate change? Great, thank you so much, and thank you for the question. It's a fundamental question, obviously, to this entire debate, and this is the exact question 
that the Coalition for Digital Environmental Sustainability CODES has been debating for the last year. Now, for those that are not aware of CODES, it is a follow-up to the Secretary General's roadmap for digital cooperation. There are 1,000 stakeholders from 100 different countries inside CODES. And, and this is really a coalition that's seeking to co-design an action plan for a sustainable planet in the digital age, as you say, bringing together digital technologies to really accelerate environmental sustainability. And the CODES action plan is trying to co-define a, a, a North Star, a common vision, a set of values, and a set of priorities for really bringing together digital and green transitions. Um, just to say that CODES includes experts from governments, private sector, academia, civil society. Germany and Kenya are acting as co-champions together with UNEP, UNDP, and others. So what are the key messages coming out of the CODES action plan? Well, there's a basic consensus on the need to catalyze three simultaneous systemic shifts to bring around or to bring together these twin transitions. And I I'll give you them in short form. They are enable, mitigate, innovate. So let me go through. The enabling environment. Um, we, we ultimately have to bring together the enabling environment to bring these two transitions together. And that involves connecting these communities. It involves training around digital sustainability. It involves the adoption of standards and establishing coalitions of, of common actions. That's number one. The second big shift is about mitigating, mitigating the negative impacts of digital technologies on the environment. And that's looking at emissions, energy, materials, e-waste, even misinformation. So we need a massive investment in what we're calling sustainable digitalization, right? Making sure the digitalization process is itself sustainable and that we mitigate the negative impacts of digitalization. And the, the third shift is really about innovation, right? Um, how do we start to use technologies to innovate sustainability? And in this regard, we need to be investing in digital twins of the planet, circular economy, digital product passports, sustainable consumption, new governance breakthroughs, new knowledge, uh, and a green digital uh, just transition. And, and these are all collectively referred to as digitalization for sustainability. So these are the three shifts that the action plan talks about. And ultimately, everybody recognizes that to, to achieve this, we're going to need you know, massive collaboration between governments, private sector, civil society to take them forward. So within this action plan, there are nine impact initiatives that are recommended. And these are really designed uh, to catalyze these three systemic shifts. So bringing together the digital transformation and the environmental uh, shifts into a common Twin transition. Now, this action plan will be launched two weeks from now in Stockholm Plus 50. And the other, um, the, the other target to really uh, influence the, the outcomes of this action plan is the Global Digital Compact. As was mentioned previously, this is a huge opportunity to really start to think about the vision and values for digital transformation. And we are hoping that the, the green element, the sustainability element of that can really be um, uh, integrated within this global. <coughs> Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much for this. And uh, let me move to Andrea Poggi, who is here on the stage with me, because Andrea, uh, I know that a recent survey from Deloitte that showed that kind of 50% of European citizens they do think that digitization is the area where European resources should be invested to make the next step and to create more growth and sustainable growth and so on. But we know that resource, even though we do have the next generation EU, national plans of recovery and resilience, but resources are limited. So we have to pick and choose. We have to make a selection or where to invest more effectively. And what's your idea of where these investment flows should be directed to be more effective? Thank you for this question, Paul. I strongly believe that uh, there is, a, for sure, a, a limit in, in the investments, but at the same time, there is a fantastic magnitude of EU investment uh, in this moment, because in addition to the 800 billion euros coming from the NGU program, if we consider the EU multi-annual uh, financial framework, we have more than 2 trillion euros dedicated to the European uh, development. And 
of these 2 trillion, 1.8 trillion euros, are fully dedicated to digitalization, innovation, sustainability, and social cohesion. So it means that uh, the, the level of investment coming from EU is uh, uh, extraordinary. At the same time, in order to answer your question, uh, there is another key element we should underline. There is a, 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 a great alignment between uh, the expectations uh, defined by the citizen, as you mentioned before, the priorities identified by the companies, uh, and the national gover government plans and the European priorities. Uh, if we look at citizens, as you said before, 49% of the citizens think that digitalization is the main priority. 59% are the Italians who think that uh, digitalization and innovation should be the main priority of the government. At the same time, more than 85% of the European citizens are ready to live in a more digitalized environment after the pandemic. But if these are the expectations coming from the citizens, we can say that the same approach is from companies. 85% of the CIOs we interviewed confirmed that uh, they are increasing the budget dedicated to the digital investment by 25% uh, more than last year and they have more than 50% of initiatives dedicated to digitalization. Citizens, companies consider digitalization a priority, and the governments have defined that more than 25% of the NGO fund will be dedicated to innovation and digitalization, even if the limit clarified by the European institution was 20%. And this percentage of investment are higher in the countries where the perception of citizens regarding the level of dig digitalization is lower. So where citizens think that we need more digitalization, the government reacted putting more money on digitalization. So this is a fantastic alignment where we think uh, we should work in order to leverage this openness coming from citizens and companies, addressing, as you asked before, the investment in few selected areas where digitalization and innovation are key. There is a, a specific uh, uh, area where we think we can change the approach generating more benefits. And this area is uh, what we call technological transfer. So we need to focus our investment in order to increase the level of research, to put in contact research universities with uh, companies, and be sure that the startups, the new ideas, are fully integrated in the larger company in order to accelerate the execution of innovation and in order to give a chance to the new ideas and the, to the new innovators. So uh, open innovation, uh, technological transfer are, in our opinion, the right way to start the execution uh, of the investments uh, related to the next generation. Well, I've got a couple of very quick questions on that, but we've got just a, two to three minutes each for a quick second round of questions. And uh, I would start with Katrina Deja, if Katrina Deja is still connected with us, because I saw that she went black on her connection. Let me see if she's there. Or no, not. I'm here. I was just saving on bandwidth. Okay, <laughs> that's, that's good. That's <laughs> a good <laughs> strategy. Okay, <laughs> appreciate that. Now, Katrina Adeya, uh, I've got a question about digital innovation uh, in Africa, which uh, in general is apparently lagging behind, but there are some, some ex exceptions, like what you call the Silicon Savannah in Kenya. What is the secret behind oh, this experience? How successful is this? And do you think that it might be replicated in different regions of areas in Africa? 
Um, okay. In fact, I think it might be worth starting by saying that the concept of the Silicon Savannah came up during my time in government when I was uh, the founder CEO of Kenya's first smart mm -hmm. city. That's when people kept talking about us. Uh, they kept referring to us as the Silicon Valley of Africa. And we told them there's no valley here and there's no Silicon Valley, but we came up with the Silicon Savannah. But one secret behind our successful digital ecosystem is simply the youthful population, coupled with the right infrastructure enabling environment for them to innovate and scale their innovations. And also at the time, I'll say at the time, because it depends, I think somebody earlier on talked about governments, but what I found a success then was championship from government. At the time, the president was very in involved. Because for years, you know, many people have viewed digital technology as a great enabler. And I think I've had it discussed here, an opportunity for African countries to accelerate development. And it's true. We've seen new industries come up. We've seen uh, a lot of opportunities. But really, should Africa be trying to recreate Silicon Valley? Hmm. And I think for many, the understanding is there, even within Africa. I don't think it's about creating, recreating uh, Silicon Valley. But it's really about creating something that's uniquely African, with companies building technologies that specifically meet the needs of their people. Uh, we do innovate, and we must continue to inno innovate to solve our unique problems. But I must emphasize, because I've had this question uh, before about replication. If replication is to harness the creative potential of the young people in Africa, then I'm okay with that. If replication is to become more Western, and mirror the DNA of Silicon Valley, then I have a major problem with that. So, you know, Africa, as I've said, Africa is the home of many innovators. We've got the educated population. But for example, in my home in Kenya, um, it's, it's a home to over, I think it's, it was over $1 billion uh, of tech hub, uh, in, the, in the tech hub, hundreds of startups. And then I sit back and I often found myself asking questions like, who is starting now? Who is finishing? Because there's even been questions of IPs being stolen. Let's, let's, let's discuss the hard questions in the room. There's been a lot of hue and cry about the non-Kenyan CEOs of startups. Uh, even, though, even though some argue that, oh, of course, there's a lot of Kenyan startups. I'm giving Kenya as an example. This could be Nigeria and many other countries. They say they've been startups by locals that have not been profitable. But the jury is out uh, on the reasons why. I don't think we can delve into it in a discussion like this. But at least in the last few years, in the last five years especially, I've begun to see more African CEOs of startups that are, success, are succeeding. They're few and far between because of challenges, especially of local funding. Uh, and, but what was evident to me, because I've been researching in this area for very many years, it seems the more Ivy League you are, then the more funding came in. Um, and. Uh, Again, I'll not go into further, to, uh, further discussions about that. So in summary, really, what do I see um, to be able to flourish uh, in, in what you're calling um, in your question? I'm going back to your question again on the success of the digital innovation. What do I see? Just three quick points. Uh, first of all, the majority of people in the continent are still offline, and they must get connected. We've already discussed that. I had the UN discussing that. So about 33% of the people in Africa are connected today. There are even fewer who are meaningfully connected. I, we, dis, we discuss meaningful connectivity, and that's the quality of access. So right now, I've got so many gadgets here in my house. But the issue is that it, it could drop any time. Then the cost is completely unaffordable, unaffordable to most people. We've got research from the Web Foundation that shows that in, on, on average, uh, an average African pays about 3.3% of their average monthly income for just one GB of data. How many people can afford that? So these are some of the issues I'm raising. And then of course, digital skills is a major factor, uh, which is keeping people offline. And second, of course, is the need for quality infrastructure. I can delve into this anytime, but I'm just conscious of the time. So of course, quality infrastructure, we discussed it again, that's high speed internet. But even looking at things like using Nigeria, the startups face regular power outages. We need to be innovative about uh, even how we can continue to engage on these issues of power. Uh, people have been coming up with great ideas, uh, but you find many of them running on very expensive power generators. Then finally, I think really simply, African startups just need access to capital. It's a difficult discussion, but it's a discussion that uh, has been there because a fraction of the investment 
available in US and, and Europe. We just need a fraction of that. Uh, and although more American funding is flowing, uh, it goes more to the experts in, um, in, 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 in Africa. Uh, and we're not seeing enough of it going to homegrown talent. So um, allow me to summarize there. I can continue again, because I'm conscious that everybody else has to. Uh, and of course, we'll still go back to government. There's always government, the government, the government. And of course, uh, the government still need to invest uh, and support to create a, st a strong pipeline. And uh, of course, education. Mm -hmm. So I I'll leave it there because um, I think the issues are clear. Uh, but the potential is there and it's, it's happening. Mm -hmm. So where there's a perception that there's still a need to kind of rescue, the, the challenges really is capital access, uh, affordability. And these are some of the issues uh, to, to make sure that at least we continue to see the success we've seen in the last five years or so. Thank you. Thank you, Katarina. That was really impressive and also uh, really challenging, you know, thinking of what are the main ingredients that are needed to make this step from connectivity to access to capital market. And with this, let me get back uh, um, to Europe, Penchukutsev, because there's a lot of discussion about technological sover sovereignty in, in Europe. And it's all about the fact that we are lagging in terms of technology and we're leading, leading in terms of regulation, or at least that's the way European feels in, in Brussels. Uh, what do you think is the, the condition to be sovereign from a technological standpoint and at the same time remain open for business for the rest of the world? I don't have the recipe, but uh, when we were discussing the, the question, the first thing to my mind was um, how to strengthen the digital uh, sovereignty of Europe while remaining open. The first thing to my mind was do our homeworks. Um, and uh, when we think of the dependency nowadays, when you compare the situation with the energy sector, the dependency in the digital sector is even worse. We have 100 percentage dependence on, on, on foreign players in, in, in Europe. So that's really terrible uh, uh, situation. Um, so that's why the Commission is right in proposing the Data Chips Act um, to confront uh, semiconductor shortages. That's a really important issue. Um, but also one another important aspect is to focus on more proactive policy and to leave aside the reactive policies. The DMA is reactive policy. It's just one part of the reg regulatory package in Europe. Um, what also Roberto Viola mentioned it today, the, the Data Governance Act and the upcoming uh, Data Act, which are really important for the, for the digital future of, of Europe. Um, so thinking of our homeworks, what to do first? We can do much more open data policy in Europe. So, it's not the fault of the gatekeepers for having such a bad open data policy across Europe. We need much more and better common language when it comes to the so-called high value data sets in Europe. Those are the data sets that show how our, our society <coughs> perform. Um, and we are waiting for the proposal from the directorate of Mr. Viola for more than uh, a year. So hopefully they are going to uh, 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 draft it in the coming uh, uh, days. So let's do more open data. Let's improve our e-government policies across state. It's not the fault of the gatekeepers for having such bad services in some, some countries. Um, so um, the second, what can we do more? We have mentioned the Data Governance Act. We need real incentives when it comes to data intermediaries in Europe. We have strange way of thinking in Europe. If we want to have something, then we produce regulation. And regulation is not always good. Regulation is, always, is only good if it produces the, the, the welcome uh, uh, impact. And um, currently, I don't see any economic incentives in Europe for having new data intermediaries. What are data intermediaries? Data intermediaries are data institutions that should facilitate the data sharing in Europe. And closely connected to this issue is the, data, is, is the issue of data donation in Europe as well. So, uh, when it comes to openness, yes, we are currently producing regulation because we have obvious market failures. The DMA 
is the answer of the market failure that we have. We don't have currently openness in Europe. We don't have counter-stable markets. We would like to um, facilitate the, uh, the level playing field for new entrants in Europe. We don't have at the moment, and the DMA must be implemented in the, in the coming years. Um, we are producing the digital services act because we, we have obvious threat for our democracy. Then, uh, uh, we can't tolerate it, uh, what's going on in the, in the social media spectrum anymore. So it's really at cru it's, it's of crucial importance that the DSA also performs uh, well. Um, I've mentioned this, the issue of convergence with the, with the US. Uh, US. Um, last but not least, openness is fine, but we shouldn't be naive. There are too many killing acquisitions going on in Europe. We should open up uh, our eyes. Um, and there are too many undertakings who, who are relying on foreign subsidies and who are active on European markets um, that are foreclosing the competition in Europe. So this must be stopped in the near future. Absolutely, that's very interesting. And uh, you know, also the antitrust profile of many operation is to look carefully. And uh, Jose Siabaserate, you already uh, covered many points, I mean, in terms of the future of digital assets and currency, including the central bank's digital currency. And we understood that it's going to take too long, in your perspective, to you know, address the main challenges currently. But so, in just in a nutshell, what do you think should be the better approach? And do you think that given the volatility, the extreme volatility and some crashes that we've seen in the digital asset spectrum, this is going to attract more attention in the future or investors will be more careful and cautious on that? Well, investors are already talking of a Luna 2.0 version. <laughs> <laughs> so not that cautious. Governed by the same people that created the Luna first uh, uh -huh. version. So, so don't expect uh, these kind of investors be shy mm -hmm. because of this thing. Because if one thing uh, follows with uh, cryptocurrencies is that they have always lived in, in a very turbulent uh, uh, environment. Uh, Bitcoin... Uh, just to, 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 to show you the risks, uh, Bitcoin has uh, came down 80% from their heights three times in, in its short history. And Bitcoin is still uh, fighting there. So uh, what I would say is uh, I think we can afford a short-term uh, solution to provide a stable uh, monetary instrument, a, a real stable coin, to the system and that we, we can do that in a very short time span. And that should be, uh, I think, the priority. And I, I do not know if I explain well, but uh, you, you, you already have digital currencies in the form of commercial bank money, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, or you can uh, just take a, a, a new chapter in the banking law, licensing safe stable coin Issuers as narrow banks, which is a thing they are, so they, they will carry less risk than commercial banks, and they can supply these uh, uh, highly mm -hmm. uh, liquid risk free assets as a deposit backed by federal deposit insurance and with access to the central bank balance sheet, which would provide liquidity in case of crisis, as it happened last week. In, in that sense, I would say you can treat uh, stablecoin issuers as uh, banks or a very special type of banks and uh, ask for them to, to have uh, reserves needed to do the backing. That is, they will need to, to have a pool of very safe and liquid assets yeah. under the control of a central bank and the central bank could provide them Mm -hmm. uh, access to the reserves, and you can do that for the digital space or the digital sphere as you do that for the real world. Mm -hmm. Alternatively, you can tokenize, I said, commercial bank deposits running on the blockchain, so in, in the digital area, and provide the same monetary service from legacy banks. Yeah. So that could be done. That is, uh, I, I think, a good uh, response that could be made very quickly 
yeah. to the type of uh, security breach or instability uh, the Terra Luna affair has shown. Uh, okay, so thanks. I, 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 I suggest that that is the way to, to go forward. Thank you, uh, Jose Siamaserati. Okay. We've got to uh, wrap, it, wrap it up a bit. David Jensen, we're talking about technologies that from a certain standpoint are not uh, so friendly to the environment. For example, you know, blockchain mining or Bitcoin mining is not blockchain. Bitcoin mining is kind of uh, consuming a lot of energy, for example. How do you make of this? Yeah, I mean, completely agree that the way that digital technologies are being designed is, is not green enough. I think there are really three problems to solve. Uh, first of all, they're not being designed from the outset with sustainability goals in mind, as you pointed out, in terms of energy use, but also in terms of being modular or being repairable or having their materials uh, be recoverable. So there's a design problem that needs to be solved. The second big problem is it's really hard to track the environmental and the carbon impact of digital uh, technologies across their life cycle. And the third is that they're generating a massive amount of e-waste and there are very limited solutions right now for economic circularity. Right now, I think only 17% of all e-waste is recycled. So these are the three big problems. I think the solutions are pretty straightforward. First, we need global standards to assess and compare the environment and carbon footprint of different digital technologies. Second, uh, we need digital product passports to track and trace the materials and the natural resources within those technologies so they can be recovered and as part of a circular economy. And finally, we need to really use our procurement power to invest in green digital infrastructures. So I think there is certainly hope on the horizon. There's a, a lot of uh, regulation in place by the Green Deal that are addressing these issues, and these are very much what uh, the CODES uh, Coalition and Action Plan also hope to support going forward. All right. Thanks, David Jenten. And, and uh, lastly, Andrea Poggi, our uh, title of the panel was Leading to a Fair and Sustainable Growth. It means also an inclusive growth, leaving no one behind. Is that possible or technology might, you know, broaden the gap and inequalities because in, at some point it might also do that? It's possible and, in our opinion, uh, it's uh, mandatory. Uh, what is uh, evident uh, is that after the pandemic in particular, we are looking for uh, innovation able to uh, uh, answer citizens' and individuals' needs more than before. Because in the past, the main reasons for digitalization program wo was to guarantee efficiency and cost reduction first. Now the priority, and the pandemic in this case helped a lot, uh, uh, the, the, the digitalization uh, 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 is clearly focused on uh, guarantee that individuals are the center. And if we look again at the NGU investment, NGU projects, uh, there is a, a, a strong uh, focus on healthcare system, green economy, and it's evident quality of life, quality of work. If we think and if we underline the value of all the projects related to the transportation, to mobility, to proximity mobility, to the uh, ability of the new projects to increase uh, the level of access to the healthcare system, to uh, the ability of the healthcare system to uh, be more focused on the pre pre prevention and not only on the level of the cures. It's evident that the NGU program is fully dedicated to satisfy the individual needs. And it's evident that uh, based on this, the pandemic uh, 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 clarified where are the priorities. Obviously, the precondition, as you said before, is that we are able to extend the connectivity to all the people and the target we have in Italy to be sure that more than 70% of the citizen will be digital capable by 2026 seem to be aligned to what we have to realize, a more anthropocentric digitalization process. Thank you so much, Andrea Poggi, together with Katrina Deia, David Jensen, Pencho Kuzev, and Jose Siaba Serrate. Please, a round of applause to the speaker of our panel. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. 
and we are immediately ready for the second sessions on key implication. We are ready for our second session of the key implication data and cybersecurity taming risks, reaping opportunities, together with Penn Dixon, founder and executive director of the World Privacy Forum, Robert Fay, managing director in digital economy CIGI, Vangelis Cantas, cybersecurity experts at the EU Agency for Cybersecurity. We also have connected Samir Patil, senior fellow at ORF, and together with me on the stage here in Milan, Andrea Rigoni, government and public services global cyber leader at Deloitte. Let me start with Pam Dixon this session uh, because we want to discuss data. We are in the data economy, in the data society, but we know there are high risk of illicit use of our data from different perspectives. What are the main risks for consumer more specifically that you can see today? Yes, thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to join you today. And this is one of my favorite topics to talk about. So thank you for the opportunity. So when you think about risks to consumer in a more digitalized space, you've really got to think across a very nuanced continuum of potential risks. And you need to think at a couple of different levels. So for example, you've really got to start with considering the ecosystem that you're looking at to determine what kind of risks already exist in that ecosystem. You've also got to look at more of a collective risk. Are there groups of people who may be more at risk than others? And then of course you get to political risks, which are very, very difficult to mitigate for. And then finally you come to an individual level of risk. And all of these fall into different categories. But one of the things that has happened routinely in the discussion of risks of digitalization is that these arenas of risk have been mashed together or pushed together in ways that confuse the issues. So if I may, I'll just start with a couple of examples from, for example, an ecosystem level risk and then kind of move through um, things. So at the ecosystem level, really, there are, there are really a, a key risk, which is exclusion. And that may say, sound really strange coming from a privacy expert, but we have um, really looked at large ecosystems of data, including India's Aadhaar system, among many, many others. But the thing is, is that it ends up that exclusion to goods or services is really among the largest risks there. So for example, in Kenya, they have a national ID system. It's a wonderful technological system. However, there are 30,000 approximate people who are not allowed to get that ID. And the reason is because they are not considered to be um, eligible for citizenship, whether they were born there or not. That is a political risk that's attached to an ecosystem. And this is uh, one of the very key ways that you see this developing. In terms of collective risks, one of the great collective risks that we're seeing over and over as economies develop are risks in terms of profiling and categorizing people. You see this in AI systems and in um, systems such as advertising, which are uh, fueled by AI. So for example, you can have a person who is living in poverty and once they're categorized in this way, what tends to happen is they get very, very promiscuous um, advertisements and uh, leads for uh, quite negative credit applications with very high interest rates and things like this. So there are risks that start with privacy and end as being financial risks for consumers living in poverty. These are just some of the risks. 
And then in certain economies, and I think United States is a very good example of this, one of the very serious risks to individuals is identity theft. There is a very, an ongoing significant problem with identity theft in the United States. During the pandemic, the financial center of the treasury that deals with fraud, FinCEN, found profound amounts of fraud based on identity theft and applying for COVID-19 grants. And unfortunately, then when the real people tried to apply for their grants, their names had already been given this information. So uh, this kind of fraud is, uh, is very, very damaging. And then finally, I would say that one of the things that happens also on an individual level is you have individuals who are subject to data breach. Of course, this, this data breach and unauthorized access to technical systems with a lot of data in them, this is a risk that runs from the ecosystem all the way down on through, and it has broad impact. So those are just a, a smattering, just a collection of some of the key risks across the spectrum. All right, thank you, Pam Dixon. Thank you so much for this. Let me move to um, Samir Patil. And Samir Patil, we know that uh, data economy and also cyber secur securities relies a lot on infrastructure. And the evolution of infrastructure, for example, in the telecom sector, is opening a wide discussion, especially Western countries. It started the US, and then lately Boris Johnson, he proposed, he launched the idea of creating a 5G with uh, you know, some technical characteristics that are common just to democratic countries versus autocratic countries. And we know the level of conflict and contrast that there has been, especially from the US authority to Chinese providers of 5G equipment. Do you think that it makes sense, cooperation, technological cooperation, and are we heading towards a splinter net, so a divided you know, digital world in different blocks, also given the geopolitical tensions or, or not? Okay, good evening from Mumbai, and uh, I'm really pleased to be part of this uh, interesting conversation. So thank you, Andrea, for your question on the, on the collaboration between the democracies. So my answer would be a, a resounding yes, because uh, if you look at the uh, the current uh, technological industrial innovation basis in the democracies, I think uh, the, we are now confronting a very stark reality, which is that uh, the, the West and the democracies the world over are no longer enjoying the kind of technological lead that they had a couple of uh, decades ago, even years ago. We have the principal authority in regimes like China and Russia, which are pursuing these technologies to reduce their capability gap and attain the competitive advantage. Uh, and so this kind of uh, tech, uh, the, the, the quest for tech supremacy is not just driving the, the global competition, but also the patterns of cooperation. Again, coming back to China and Russia, they have joined hands uh, to collaborate and innovate on some of the technologies such as artificial intelligence, quantum computing, biotechnology, uh, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so really, you know, that there is a determined effort by the authoritarian regimes to actually take the lead in emerging technologies. And if you if you combine that with the kind of confrontationist attitude that these authoritarian regimes have shown, uh, we can refer to the Russian invasion of Ukraine and uh, China's uh, uh, protracted border standoff with, with India in the Himalayas, which has been going on since uh, late uh, 2020. I think that really makes it imperative for the like-minded democracies to come together and strengthen their tech uh, collaboration. It's also true that if you look at the, the rapid speed of the tech developments, uh, I think you really cannot have a unitary or solo effort to develop and adopt these uh, these technologies. That just won't really yield any optimum result. So, so the kind of collaboration which which Prime Minister Boris Johnson proposed, the D10 and the tech collaboration amongst the democracies, or the idea which came from the United States, the, the idea of techno democracies, liberal democracies with advanced uh, tech sectors and leading economies. I think it really makes sense because they can really provide the necessary anchor and foundation for collaboration between the between the democracies. Uh, and even there is a financial logic to this, because if you look at, for instance, the once in the century pandemic, the COVID-19, I think that has really strained the economies and resource mobilization. It has also distracted uh, many democracies from their strategic goals. So so, so when, when, when the democracies will come together, 
it will in a sense lead to the cost sharing for innovation uh, enable the optimal use of the the limited or finite budgetary resources and also achieve the ec economies of scale so uh, so premise of boris johnson's book about the 5g but i think there are other such areas also where where the democracies can come together countering disinformation and propaganda uh, in the cyberspace i think one uh, there can be one great example of, of, of collaboration. There's also the issue of setting up the international standards because we have seen that China has utilized its take lead, uh, global reach and influence to, uh, to really set the favorable standards for its domestic uh, tech sector. So that began with the 5G network, but it's also going to uh, now uh, permeate into the artificial intelligence and internet of things. So really the democracies should come together and develop the new international rules, norms and standards for this emerging tech. Uh, another area of collaboration could be crafting the cyber deterrence uh, posture to counter and deter the malicious cyber activities coming from the authoritarian regimes. And finally, I think in my view, democracies also need to come together to take the lead on quantum uh, computing because the technology is still in the nascent stages, but I think uh, it has wider implications uh, for encrypted communications, cryptography, uh, radar, modeling and simulation, and so on and so forth, just like the 5G is going to transform the entire uh, tech ecosystem. So that really makes it an ideal candidate for the collaboration amongst the democracies. And to answer your question about the Sprinternet, I think yes, it will in a sense cause that kind of schism, but that schism actually is coming not from the the, from the, the source of the technology, but it also is actually coming from the vision of the democracies and the vision of the authoritarian regimes in terms of how to manage uh, the cyberspace. Thank you. Thank you, Samir Patil. I would like to liaise on these points to uh, and move to Robert Fay because we just heard the importance of technological cooperation, and we already mentioned data governments. It was uh, Roberto Viola at the beginning in the opening session remarking what the EU, the EU is doing in this direction. But what you make, and how can we work on a globally agreed framework of uh, digital governance, and what do you mean by that? Okay, hey, great. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today. And um, there's already been a really rich discussion, and I'm afraid I'm probably going to repeat some of the points that have been made. Um, but that's good because it'll reinforce, I think, some common some common uh, views. So before I, I, I embark on what I what I would characterize for a global framework for digital governance, um, let me just begin with why I think we need what we've termed a new digital Bretton Woods. So I think, as everyone knows, Bretton Woods was set up at the end of World War II, and that system was for a world of borders, for a world of industrial production, for trade and commodities, and manufactured goods. And as we've already heard, the digital world is none of those things. And I'm going to give six very brief reasons why I think this world is different, um, and there's many, many more. So obviously, as we've heard, it's driven by data-driven uh, technologies. That's based on investment and accumulation of intangible assets, essentially to control intellectual property and the rents that accrue from it. It, the, it rewards first, first movers whose business models benefit from economies of scale and scope, of asymmetric information from network effects that are manifesting themselves in a winner takes all environment. And these new technologies are transforming all sectors and creating new market structures that we haven't seen before. And as we've heard um, from Ms. Dixon, you know, our personal data are being monetized by more firms than we can count. I went into Google privacy settings and I think I found 250 firms following me that I don't think I had uh, consented to. And apparently every single one of them is there to deliver services that I need. And, um, and, and so we have this you know, invasion of our own personal privacy, um, you know, the data, it's affecting a whole bunch of areas. We've heard cybersecurity, privacy, public safety, national security, even electoral integrity. So finally, this is a world that, you know, it's pitting firms against each other, countries against each other for these large data stores. Um, and we have the firms and that have the technologies and the infrastructure that have the skills and they have the power to decide the rules and uh, um, associated with how the data are being used. So it's a world where our governance structures are not well suited. Um, 
And it's, as we've also heard, it's not an inclusive world. We know that developing countries have borne the brunt of some of the, the worst harms that, uh, that can come out of some of the uses of some of these technologies. So that's why uh, we need new bread and woods. And so where do we go from here? So in the previous panel, uh, David Jensen had talked about the UN's Global Digital Compact, which follows from their excellent high-level uh, panel report, and is very ambitious and it's very commendable. At CG, we're advocating something different, and we're, we're calling it a Digital Stability Board which is modeled after the Financial Stability Board. And the Financial Stability Board is a multi-stakeholder um, inst driven institution that was set up by G20 leaders um, during the great financial crisis. And it was created to rein in and regulate global banks and insurers in the face of the light touch regulatory framework that had existed and ultimately led to the great financial crisis and the vast societal harms that resulted. So at least from our perspective, the, S the FSB has had a lot of success um, in navigating the various powerful and competing vested interests that exist in the financial services sector. So we think in a similar fashion, you could create a digital stability board that would be a multi-stakeholder um, representative forum that would frame the global governance for big data, for AI, for digital platforms, while allowing national variation to reflect different values and cultures. And then members could produce a set of global public goals for data, uh, develop model standards and regulations and share best practices and monitor risks. Mm -hmm. And importantly, you know, it can be scaled. Um, one of the things that is lacking right now is a, a global comprehensive discussion on privacy, competition, cybersecurity together. Yeah. Um, so let me stop there and um, thank you and, for that. Uh, thank you, Robert yeah. Fay. And uh, we discussed cybersecurity, but Andrea Rigoni, how about a cyber attack? And a cyber attack can be considered an armed attack, a military attack. And what if a country, a NATO country, uh, was submitted to a cyber attack? Could that trigger a counterattack from NATO to the offensors? Potentially, yes. For many years, there has been a debate inside NATO since 2002 about uh, the nature of the cyber attacks. I don't think there's any doubt today that uh, cyber is considered one of the operational domains, uh, you know, for national defense and for the defense of the uh, alliance. Uh, um, uh, you have been reading very often the art about Article 5. Is there a possibility that uh, in case of a cyber attack, uh, the Alliance can invoke Article 5. Article 5 says that uh, an attack to one of the Allies is an attack to the entire Alliance. And the entire Alliance can answer uh, across all five domains, not just cyber. So I get a cyber attack, I might launch a rocket against uh, my enemy. So my first answer was theoretically yes. I think it's an impossible scenario, and I explain you why. First of all, I think uh, uh, if we analyze uh, what is happening between Russia and Ukraine and between uh, not only just the two contenders, uh, but you know, all the other players, including the activists uh, that enter into the game, the attribution of cyber attack is almost impossible. So you think, you guess, uh, there might be that actor behind a certain attack, uh, but there's no certainty. Um, uh, uh, second, uh, uh, we, did an, we haven't assisted to any major you know, escalation. We are in a war. We are in a war in 2022. So we might have expected uh, 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 attacks uh, with a much greater impact. Uh, that didn't happen. Now, I don't want to enter into discussion why you know, I have my own explanation. Uh, and in simple words, uh, a cyber attack is complex uh, to uh, uh, put in place. Uh, you can't simply say, I'm going to attack that infrastructure. It takes months, if not years. And second, uh, there is an important role of players that are, sometimes are supported by the government, but are not part of the government. Now, I think the real concern is not about uh, the attack uh, themselves and the possibility of an escalation, uh, but is how this is affecting the world uh, of digital transformation and digital services. Uh, I mean, one of the effects uh, with 
uh, uh, threats of you know, disconnections and potential attacks uh, and changing balances between countries, uh, there's an increasing skepticism on the adoption of digital models. What might happen? Because here, the conflict is permeating a domain that is mainly being developed for supporting governments and business and the inclusion of citizens that is becoming a, a worth the So mm, uh, uh, my recommendation is uh, that we need to define a new doctrine. It's not just defense translated into the cyber domain. We need to work on a completely different uh, cyber defense doctrine uh, where resilience, uh, as Richard Clark uh, wrote in his book, you know, from a 20 years experience in the US government, that uh, you know, resilience, so preparing and avoiding the attacks uh, is core. All the investments that countries have been doing in cyber defense capabilities, I'm a bit skeptical that they didn't produce the expected results. I see. Oh, it's, it's fascinating. Vangelis Kantas, can you tell us more on how, where are we, especially given the Ukraine war, in terms of cooperation and international European cooperation on cybersecurity? Uh, hello, uh, Andrea, thank you for, uh, for having me here. So um, international and EU cooperation is there, uh, is present. Now, uh, we at ENISA, we, we are reaching out to critical sectors. We are monitoring uh, sector maturity uh, during this crisis. Uh, we al already know that, uh, uh, that mature sectors like telecoms, uh, core internet, uh, they, they are able to deal with, uh, with state actors and large-scale attacks. So they are already, already cooperating. We have seen uh, during this crisis uh, regulatory authorities cooperating with uh, providers in critical infrastructures, issuing guidance, uh, security advisories, uh, and saying, uh, you know what, guys, this is not the time of uh, issuing fines, but uh, you know, help each other uh, and prepare for this uh, for the coming attacks. Uh, and we uh, we are also been making preparedness preparedness calls with national competent authorities uh, in EU member states in critical sectors. Um, we have been trying to provide situational awareness information uh, in private and public entities. Uh, so there is uh, there's a lot of cooperation going on uh, in the midst of this Ukrainian crisis. Now, um, uh, in general, and uh, looking at the broader cooperation picture, now there are challenges in cooperation and information sharing, and mostly due to the fact that. Um, uh, the, the, Information sharing is considered uh, as a matter of national security for uh, for most countries, uh, but there are many steps being taken to establish a plethora of cooperation structures. Uh, now, take the NIS uh, directive, the first NIS directive, uh, for example. Uh, it uh, established the NIS cooperation group uh, to provide strategic guide guidance to the member states uh, on the implementation of this directive. Uh, now, we have the uh, the CERT uh, network, which uh, which is a, which is a network of a national sea search uh, to promote information sharing uh, and incident ha handling at the technical level. So we have cooperation there at the, at the lowest level. Uh, we have the, the, the sectorial ISACs, uh, which are information sharing and analysis centers. These are uh, public-private uh, partnerships uh, for information sharing, uh, for incidents, um, uh, providing trainings and uh, lesson learns on, uh, lessons learned on incidents. Uh, and of course, now with the NIS2 that has been uh, approved a few days ago, uh, we have this, the Cyclone structure, which is a, a cyber crisis liaison network. Uh, it's uh, it's activated during uh, major attacks, major incidents, and it's uh, situated between the um, uh, the technical level of the scissors and the political level uh, to provide coordination and cooperation. The NIS itself, the NIS uh, too itself, uh, has provisions for cooperation and peer learning among the member states to encourage them to cooperate and discuss with each other uh, on the matters of uh, NIS to implementation. Uh, and finally, let's not forget the, the joint cyber unit, which is uh, mandated by the EU cybersecurity strategy, and uh, its objective is to serve as a real cybersecurity shield for the EU. Uh, and being able to detect uh, potential threats before they can cause uh, large-scale damage. So there are major steps being taken in, on cooperation. Uh, 
uh, and we at Tenisa hold cooperation efforts at the cornerstone of, cornerstone of our activities. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Evangelis Kantas, for this comprehensive outlook on what's happening in terms of cooperation on cybersecurity. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, just a few minutes for a second round of questions, uh, kind of two minutes each for answering. Now, Pam Dixon, let me get back to you, because also in the first hit, you mentioned face recognition and our biometrics technologies, which are creating a great stride. As you know, there's a lot of talk about surveillance capitalism and, uh, you know, social scoring methods that in some countries are based on this. And there's a lot of concern about how to regulate this be before it takes control. What's your take on this? Yes, thank you. This is really the question of of the time that we're in right now. And it's a really important question. So currently the state we're in is there's a lot of attention on face recognition modalities, but there are about 22 biometric modalities and about 50% of the world's uh, jurisdictions already have mandatory iris and fingerprint based national IDs. So we have to understand that at a very deep level, biometrics is already loose in the world and at varying levels of regulation. And at this point in time, we can't look at regulating face recognition on its own. That would lead to deeply fragmented policy and it would actually end up, uh, I think, losing the trust of people because you would have to exclude all of the governments already using this modality in a mandatory way. So I do think there's a different approach here. And I think it's really important to understand this. So first, it is not possible to use consent as a primary tool for regulating biometrics. Secondly, it's not possible to use bans like banning face recognition as a primary solution to the problem. The, the alternative is, there's a good model for it, but the alternative in general means that you're going to apply to the entire ecosystem of biometrics, inclusive of all modalities, not just one, not two, not three, but all modalities and find a regulation that provides systemic administrative and procedural protections. So for example, registration of products, pre-market requirements for certain um, you know, checkpoints, uh, documentation, post-implementation surveillance and compliance, all of these are very important. And the model we already have in place, the, there's a good regu regulatory model here. And it comes in the form of actually the structure that most jurisdictions in the world have agreed upon for chemical safety. So for example, the chemical safety models, they, they don't say, oh, let's regulate arsenic here. Let's regulate lead over here. No, it's a overall omnibus chemical safety regulation. In Europe, there is REACH and ROHIS. In the United States, you have, you have the Chemical Safety Act of the 21st century. In India, you have the National Action Plan for Chemicals. And then at the UN level, the United Nations provides a harmonizing capacity with a program that I always have to look up. It's the GHS, it's the Global Harmonization System. And what it does is that it allows all the different countries to create their own set points but they work very hard to harmonize the definitions, the cut cutoff points, and so on and so forth. And this is very, very crucial for biometrics. Otherwise, what you'll get is a situation where with air travel, with passport use, with identification documents, that will have very, very disharmonious uh, biometric strategies and uses. And biometrics has proven to be a real problem for the public, so it needs to be addressed squarely. I really like Mr. Fay's idea of uh, the FSB. Mm -hmm. um, I really think that a safety board that was globally harmonized could assist in this area as well. Yeah, but I think, yeah, yeah. But I'll right. stop there and leave it for the discussion. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Pam Dixon. Now, you mentioned also India, Samir Patil. We know that India is the second 
largest internet user base and uh, also the largest democracy on the internet. What is India doing to protect online its citizens and what are the main lessons learned from your past experience uh, and from the years that India spent online? So, in fact, uh, uh, not just uh, the second largest internet user base, it has around 700 million internet users and many of them are actually the first generation internet users. So, they really, uh, for the first time coming on the internet and trying to explore the, the, the cyberspace and the digital world. So, this rapidly expanding internet user base has really brought its own set of uh, challenges because India had already been at the receiving end of the malicious cyber activities uh, coming from China and Pakistan, but also the non-state actors, the anti-India terrorist groups based in Pakistan, which have been engaged in cyber terrorism using the cyberspace for propaganda, recruitment, and, and fundraising. So in that sense, I think, you know, that there is already a very complicated cyber a threat scenario for India. And so in response to these persistent cyber threats, uh, India has uh, treated cyber security as a public policy as, as a policy priority in the last decade. Uh, and the highlight of this was the creation of the post of the National Cyber Security Coordinator in 2015, who could really coordinate with all the security agencies and sync the efforts at the national level on cyber security issues. Uh, then within India's uh, uh, Internal Affairs Ministry, the Minister of Home Affairs, India has also set up what is called as a National Cyber Crime Coordination Center, which acts as the lead agency for tackling cyber crimes. Uh, and then finally, the Defense Ministry uh, has also set up a new tri service agency, which brings together Air Force, Navy, and the Army into the Defense Cyber Agency. And that really acts as the principal agency for all cyber security related issues within the Ministry of Defense and, and the military. Uh, there's also an emphasis on creating uh, awareness on cyber security through the cyber hygiene programs amongst the uh, internet users on what to do and what not to do uh, on the internet so that they uh, don't become the weakest link in cyber security. So, so just to say you know, that India has really treated cyber security as a, as a poor national interest and therefore a policy priority. Of course, there are some challenges in implementing this this particular uh, flagship vision, but but the focus remains on tackling cyber security. Uh, you mentioned about learning from other democracies. So as part of the broader security partnership, India has uh, engaged with the United States on cyber security. In fact, uh, in 2016, uh, India signed one of its only uh, comprehensive cyber security agreement with the United States. Uh, and with other democracies such as Japan, Australia and France, India also has a similar kind of cyber engagement where the focus is actually on leveraging each country's technical expertise. So for instance, on France, it's quantum computing, with Japan, it's robotics and 5G technology and Australia, it's again, it's again robotics. So really India has been also working with the fellow democracies, but there's also an emphasis on uh, build capacity building for the smaller uh, democracies. Uh, as part of the regional uh, cooperation. So India has sought to share its uh, best practices as well as the experience of tackling cyber threats uh, as part of its own uh, external uh, aid program, the, the Indian Technical and Economic Cooperation Program, but also uh, sharing its own digital transformation story through Aadhaar, which, which Pram Dixon mentioned, through the Aadhaar uh, story with other some of the smaller countries which want to also utilize the the national ID project and the information technology for their own digital transformation. And finally, India is also the member of the Global uh, Forum on Cyber Expertise, which also engages some of the developing countries for capacity building as well as regular exchange on cyber security issues. Let me stop. Thank, Thank you. you, Samir Patil. Now, Robert Fay, your idea of a digital FSB has become popular among our speaker, but that's an idea of a common table of negotiation, a global common table of talks on this, but at the same time, what we do see, in fact, is that the internet that was born as a universal network of communication and connection is becoming to be more fragmented, more separated. I mentioned the splinternet idea at the beginning of my first question. In a very few words, how do you see the future of the internet? Uh, well, thank you. Well, uh, I mean, what we've heard, it's um, the internet's already fragmented and it's fragmented on at the technical level by necessity, but um, at the application layer, there's just so many different values surrounding how these technologies should be used. And um, we know that the US has typically said, let tech decide how it wants to operate, although that's changing. 
in the EU, as we've already heard, there's a big focus on strategic regulation, um, but each of those regulations has extraterritorial ter implications. And then of course, China, which hasn't come up so much, but the Great Firewall. But beyond that, it's not just the firewall, um, it's its digital belt and road and its move into, into standard setting. And um, so is it surprising that countries are trying to carve out their own internet like Russia? Probably not. And I think the danger is that other countries will try to adapt a model like that. And so the fundamental question is how do democratic societies ensure our values remain at the core of the internet? And there's no easy answer. Obviously, I, you know, we propose this digital stability board to allow those discussions to take place. But one area that hasn't, I, I mean, I guess it's received a, a fair bit of attention and it, it was uh, featured in the G7 uh, digital, uh, digital minister statement uh, this past weekend. And that's the focus really on standard setting. And so standards, they're ubiqui ubiquitous. Um, uh, they're inherently part of technology, but I think the key point is it goes beyond technology. They determine the values under which technologies are being used. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to keep an eye on standard setting bodies and the influence of some jur uh, jurisdictions because um, they can have really important consequences for keeping the internet uh, open and free. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely, standardization has always showed the, an inc incredible power of creating common ground and also talks and dialogues, also at the technological level. Now, Vangelis Kantas, Andrea Rigoni said in his first uh, answer that he was expecting a higher level of cyber attacks after the Russian invasion in Ukraine. Do you feel the same? Do you have the same sense? And uh, why is that, if that's the case? Okay, I would say that um, that this is this is a misconception, uh, and this is probably due to the perceived notions that uh, wartime cyber attacks should be destructive in nature and have visible results in the physical world. Now, the available evidence shows that Russia uh, uh, employed an unprecedented number of coordinated cyber attacks uh, during the days and hours prior to the invasion, uh, in order to provide a, a strategic military advantage to its forces. And now, the main uh, targets of these attacks were, you know, government agencies, uh, military institutions, uh, critical infrastructures, uh, just, you know, um, important targets in order to give this, uh, this press advantage to its forces. Uh, we, there is evidence of, uh, uh, of alleged cyber espionage uh, from, uh, from Russia towards Ukraine, uh, stealing information from uh, Ukrainian uh, key uh, military personnel and drop uh, kill lists. Uh, and even we have the, the case at in incident uh, uh, where Russia knocked off uh, several satellites, uh, which uh, were used by Ukrainian intelligence and uh, police forces. And of course, we, uh, there was the, the result of this attack, uh, which paralyzed almost 11 giga gigawatts of German uh, wind turbines. Uh, now, uh, one, one is measuring cyber attacks. Um, we should also weigh uh, what it is to gain uh, from these cyber attacks. Now, Russia was aiming in the beginning for a swift victory. So the cyber attacks were mainly uh, aimed at taking out some initial strategic uh, uh, targets. Uh, and not, you know, uh, create a massive uh, widespread destruction in civilian infrastructure that Russia could possibly use after the invasion. Uh, in addition, uh, Russian for forces uh, were, uh, in a large extent, reliant to uh, Ukrainian civil infrastructure for their attack plans and coordination. Now that the war is taking uh, longer than Russia was anticipating, uh, they are pivoting to a strategy of, you know, wearing down Ukraine. Uh, so they continue with their cyber attacks, you know, deploying malwares, even hitting uh, again targets that they initially hit, you know, the energy uh, network, uh, the internet. Um, so, so we shouldn't expect wartime cyber attacks to be isolated, destructive events that uh, are to be decisive for the outcome of a war. Yeah. We should consider that uh, these cyber attacks are supportive to the conventional military tactics uh, and uh, and leaning on these preconceptions uh, will possibly lead to, to, you know, future failed policy and intelligence. So wartime cyber attacks usually begin in peacetime. They are covert. They are silent. They aim to offer positioning and a good foothold 
uh, to be used when the time is right during war. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. And Andrea Rigoni, what do you make of that? So I agree. I mean, uh, I'm not neglecting that uh, there has been and there is a, a, a cyber dimension in the conflict. Uh, 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 simply, you know, the outcome is different from uh, what has been theorized uh, uh, before. But I want to go back uh, to, uh, uh, you know, the risks uh, that we're facing and, you know, the understanding that we have now of risk and the Digital Stability Board that, by the way, it's an idea that I, uh, uh, that I support. You mentioned Splinternet before. I strongly believe that uh, Splinternet is already here. I mean, it's full of, you know, fragmentation at any level, not only technological. I mean, the internet was born uh, as a way to connect uh, uh, different networks, uh, but we already have many countries that are applying any kind of filters for different purposes. Uh, 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 limiting, uh, you know, the information that flows in the country or protecting the country and the citizens, many different purposes. Uh, some might, we might share, it, others uh, we, 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 don't, uh, we don't support. But that's, you know, a reality. The, I think there are many other borders that we don't see. Wallet gardens uh, created by companies, uh, not with a, uh, 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 with a malicious intent. Uh, is you know, the, the, the business model they have created. I mean, there's been youngsters that suicided because they've been neglected the access to one single platform and they had access, you know, to, uh, 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 the entire internet. Uh, um, uh, second, I think uh, there is a technological dimension that is ruling, uh, in, a, in, in, in a way, the internet. Uh, and that's where, in particular, governments and companies uh, are feeling alone. Uh, I've heard before that there's a lot of cooperation. Uh, I'm a bit skeptical. I'm one of the promoters. For, I've been for 25 years promoting you know, cooperation involved in many initiatives. Uh, is this working? No. I think, uh, you know, we have it uh, in the national strategies. We believe it is important, but the level of cooperation right now that is working is only happening between private companies when they have a very strong uh, economic interest. Outside that, uh, real cooperation in cyberspace is incredibly difficult uh, to implement, and uh, not only many actors, uh, starting from governments, they struggle to understand uh, which is the role. So that's when I said we need to uh, come up with a new doctrine, that should be you know, the first step. Uh, uh, defining which is gonna be the role of governments. That is now change, it's not anymore ruling uh, and providing policies the old way, is becoming allies to the business and the citizens in a new way. Uh, this is what they call being realistic. So thank you also for this, Andrea Rigoni, together with Fan Dixon, Samir Patil, Robert Fay, and Vangelis Kantas. Let's have a round of applause for all the speakers of our second and final session. Thank you, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for our closing session. Well, at our forum on the digital transformation, the transition in turbulent times, we had a really broad and comprehensive discussion. It's difficult to take a bottom line, to take a final take, but we will try with two outstanding speakers connected. We do have uh, Venkata Shalam Ambumozi, who's senior economy uh, area and co-chair of the T20. As you know, the, the Indonesia is uh, uh, the head and chair of G20, but here we have the co-chair of T20, and together with me here on the stage in Milan, Andrew Wyckoff, Director for Science, Technology, and Innovation at the OECD. Now, Andrew Wyckoff, let me start with you for these closing remarks, because here and there, we already mentioned artificial intelligence, which to me is the strongest force that is reshaping, you know, the way we live and also economy will look in the future. What's your take on this and how do you see all the challenges and opportunities that are connected? Well, 
Andre, let me first say thanks for the invitation. It's great to be here, and OECD is happy to be cooperating with this forum. Um, and I want to try to use AI as an umbrella for drawing a red thread through some of the things we've heard today, which has been a fascinating uh, conversation. So, first of all, I get a little bit crazy about AI because it's this umbrella term now that includes everything from data analytics to machine learning, and hopefully, uh, general AI somewhere in, in the future. But it's clearly the, the culmination of a lot of the digital transformation and could be, and I think is already proving to be, the general purpose technology of our era, uh, akin to kind of electricity in the yeah. 1880s. Um, it, it's everywhere. I don't need to tell you. It's in your phone. It's in your uh, video recommendations on streaming services. It's in radiology, uh, so forth and so on. And it's a huge potential enabler of productivity growth. We haven't seen much yet because you need this, this ecosystem, as Pam was talking about before, of drawing together human capital, uh, intangible assets, as been, has been said, uh, it, and a organizational know-how on, on how to uh, cap capture it. But with every technology, it's a double-edged sword. Okay, there's the good, and then there's some, some negatives. And if you look at electricity, you can electrocute yourself, okay? And so, same with AI. It has some, some, some negatives. Uh, the OECD, which I would say is 38 like-minded countries, uh, come, came together starting in 2016 under the Japanese presidency of the G7. We started trying to get out ahead of this a bit. And in 2019, we created principles, some of which people have been talking about today, principles, okay? And ours are good sounding principles, trustworthy, secure, transparent. Uh, that's great. And our countries adopted them in 2019, as well as six others. And then they went to form the basis of the G20 AI principles. So that's, that's great. But I get a little bit frustrated with just principles. We need to move from principles to practice. I mean, what does it really mean? And that's what we've been trying to do since uh, we've done a number of implementation uh, act activities to try to say, what does this really look like? What are the tools you need in place? And we've tried to hold countries' feet to the fire a bit. We have an observatory that tracks their policy development and says, are you walking the walk? Uh, we also bring in a lot of data, which is hard to do in this area because it's quickly evolving, but we think evidence-based policy analysis is, is terrific. But I, I, I think it was uh, Pancho who was talking about need for technicians in government, what I would call geeks in government. And that's badly needed. So we have uh, 250 geeks who work in our AI, one AI. It's called OEC Network of Experts on AI. And they help us keep abreast of where things are going and uh, where they're not going. We expected automated vehicles uh, by this point, and they're not here, and there's some good reasons why. Let me just um, end by the talk on governance, because what our principles try to do, and then the Im implementation, and now you see rules and regulations coming forward, starting with the EU, uh, but not only, um, is we've tried to move to a more anticipatory upstream governance system, which I think is what we begin to need. And that means, we started with the principles. Now we're implementing them in kind of a soft way, but getting the tools in place so that when real binding rules come through, companies and individuals have the wherewithal to try to Im implement them. Last point, okay? And it goes to Bob Fay, who I've known for a long time, and CG, uh, which is a great think tank too. Um, he talks about the FSB or a DSB, and I, I think that's not a bad idea. I'd offer the OECDs pretty close to that already. Um, but there's a part of OECD called that Yuko Hariyama was talking about, the Global Partnership on AI, which is simply hosted at the OECD. It's, it's a separate quasi-independent entity, and it's made up of 25 countries, including some non-members like India and Singapore and so forth. And I think that may be an interesting entity to watch as a new governance forum, not too far from what Bob was talking about with the Digital uh, Security Board. Absolutely. Thank you for this. It was absolutely insightful of what you guys are doing also at OECD. I do definitely agree with 
geek for government. There would be badly needed, but also philosopher maybe, and that it is for government, because AI that you've been so well described also ask new questions to us, the society and government itself. Now, Venkata Shalam and Bumozi, welcome again. It's a pleasure having you today. Now, uh, you are a co-chair of the T20 Task Force on Meaningful Digital Connectivity, Cybersecurity and Empowerment. Uh, can you tell us today what are the key issues on which the task force is focusing and if you do already have preliminary policy recommendations? Thank you, and uh, good morning, and it is my great pleasure to join the discussions today. Uh, G20 Indonesia, and uh, it believes in this uh, digital transformation as one of the priority areas. It believes that is um, this digital transformation could be a driver for the stronger and the smarter economic recovery. Uh, from that context, basically our T20 policy uh, briefs uh, has been focusing on and um, the G20 but what the T20 and the G20 as well as the B20 believes is to enable the digital transformation to become a global engine for a stronger economic growth a digital connectivity must be considered as an essential service for all which needs a rigorous and tangible action plan at the global level and here, uh, uh, being in Indonesia, uh, this region, and uh, being an emerging economy, it also wants to bring in some of the concerns uh, that the developing and the emerging economies has it. One of the concern is uh, more than 90% of the world population who are not connected to this uh, internet are from this uh, uh, developing countries. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we countries also, particularly the T20 is also aware of this uh, risk with this um, uh, breach of this uh, uh, security issues. And so we calculated as, as a part of the T20 process, we calculated what could be the implications of the data security at the global level. We, we estimated around uh, uh, 1.2 trillion and in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the future years, in the next five years. So as yes, of now, we've been focusing on the four clusters of the policy areas. One is first to accelerate the rollout of the high capacity, future-proof digital infrastructure, enhance the technological accessibility, and create on ramps to the digital economy for the excluded populations to foster innovation, competition, cooperation, as well as inclusion. Our the second recommendations coming uh, from the T20 group is uh, to harmonize the regulatory principles to ensure a fair competition and efficient markets, promote trust in the digital ecosystem by enhancing the cybersecurity and privacy protection and encourage the adaptation of interoperable policy frameworks and the common standards for facilitated gross border data flows. And third, uh, a cluster of uh, policy recommendations uh, uh, focused on the private sector, basically fostering the responsible development and the deployment of the digital technologies by leveraging the public and private cooperation in research and development, promoting investments and effective use of um, uh, good practices. And the fourth policy and the last one that is we believe that is the, there are some stakeholders that is left behind this digital transformation. Uh, that is the SME, small and medium sized enterprises, uh, as well as the local government. So the final policy is uh, promoting this um, uh, digital literacy and the digital skill gap in, in private as well as the public sector by mapping the current strategies, upskilling the individuals, updating the education curricula and encouraging the mindful use of the technologies. So with these policy briefs are being um, uh, drafted and uh, uh, we, we, we develop a kind of communique and it will be delivered to the G20 Sherpa track. All right, fantastic. Thank you so much, Venkata Shalam uh, Abumozi, and uh, good work for the Tweet 20 that you're chairing. And uh, thanks also, Andrew Wicker from the OECD, 
to all of you guys for listening and being part of the forum today, the, this forum together with the one we had a couple of weeks ago on the transition to sustainability will be also the base for the discussion of the Global Policy Forum that will take place on June the 20th and the 21st. It will be at Bocconi University, but also online in hybrid form. So thanks again to ESP for organizing these, for OES 2 acd for its cooperation, and to Deloitte for co-promoting. We at Class CNBC we're glad to be part of this discussion together with Corriere Economia as media partner of the conference. Thanks again. Take care. Bye-bye.